All right, so what I thought I would do is first give you a nice little pictorial tour of how our hardware systems have changed over the years, and then talk about kind of the progression of infrastructure software that we've built over the years, starting with some of our earliest stuff, explaining what needs that me met, and then how we built follow-on systems that kind of once we had those initial needs met, uh, what we did to sort of um, build higher level systems. So we've changed a lot from these days. Uh, I'll go pretty quickly here. This was uh, kind of uh, when Google was just a Stanford research project. Um, this was kind of our first attempt at building our own hardware. We knew that we really wanted to uh, get lots of uh, computational resources per dollar, and the best way to do that was to kind of ride the commodity curve of you know, cheap commodity machines. Uh, we maybe went a little extreme here by buying a bunch of commodity components and uh, assembling them ourselves. And, there was a thin layer of cork that insulated the four motherboards from the uh, tray below. Uh, we eventually got a little bit better at things, uh, and at that point we were renting space in large uh, data centers. We rent cages, um, and they actually rented by the square foot, which was kind of interesting because they didn't charge you for power. So we kind of had an incentive to put as many machines in as we possibly could, and we had to help them out with a bit of cooling. And we also got quite good at moving out of bankrupt data centers <laughs> and into new ones. And there you go. And this is kind of the scale of our operations today. Today we're operating very large facilities that are wholly owned uh, and, op uh, with our and filled with our machines as opposed to renting pieces of uh, data centers. So these are sort of our major data center locations around the world. If you zoom into one of them, you know, you see it's a pretty big facility. Uh, it's got lots of machines in it. You know, we've gone back and forth on whether these things should have uh, cases or not. No cases seems to be winning at the moment for better airflow. Uh, even the cooling is cool. Turns out it just so happens that they're Google colors. These actually mean things to uh, cooling people. Okay, so that kind of gives you a sense of the scale. Um, obviously, if you have lots of machines, there are two things you really want to do. Uh, one is you're gonna to wanna to store some data and do, it, do so reliably on those machines, even if the individual underlying machines are not very reliable. You know, obviously that first set of corkboard machines was not a fine semblance of reliability. And so you really need the reliability to come from higher level software that can deal with failures. And the other thing you'll wanna be able to do is to run large computations over this data and do interesting things with it. Um, so over the years, we've developed a series of different pieces of infrastructure. I'm going to talk about four, uh, GFS, MapReduce, Bigtable, and Spanner, and describe kind of the environment in which we came up with these pieces of infrastructure, what problems they were solving, and what lessons we kind of learned from, from building those. Um, so the first thing we wanted to be able to do was store data reliably. And we had clusters of order, you know, a thousand machines at that time, and we really wanted to treat the disks on those machines as a single file system, not as a bunch of separate uh, individual file systems, and machines could die. So essentially, we came up with this design where you have a centralized master that manages all the metadata, the file names and the mappings of which machines have which pieces of data, and then the data is just spread out over all those machines. Um, and it's replicated, so each chunk of data is replicated three ways, so that if a machine dies, you still have other copies that you can recover that data from. And that seemed to work pretty well. Um, the main motivation was we were building our indexing system, so we start from crawled pages on disk, we have a whole bunch of those, and then we wanna go through a whole bunch of phases to eventually end up with the inverted index that we needed to serve um, you know, searches at Google. Uh, one important property, I think, was that uh, the systems were developed by a subset of the same people working on the indexing system, so we knew the requirements that we had really well. Um, and in particular, we were able to identify a minimal set of features that we really needed for our particular application. Uh, for example, our file system is not POSIX compliant. We didn't need some of the features in there, and that allowed us to simplify some aspects of the design. Uh, we decided to distribute the data but keep the metadata service in the file system centralized. And that's, again, simplified a bunch of aspects of the design. Um, eventually, we ended up distributing the metadata, but we didn't need to do that initially. We could kind of do that later on when uh, the need arose. 
So I think one important lesson is if you're building infrastructure, don't try to solve all the problems at once. Pick the really important problems that are vital to solve and defer solving other ones that uh, maybe would complicate the system you're trying to build. Um, so once we had a file system that could reliably store data, uh, we obviously wanted to do stuff with it. And again, in the context of our index indexing system, we had a whole bunch of different phases, starting with raw pages on disk and eventually ending up with the, these inverted index data structures. But there's you know, eight or 10 phases that were needed to go from raw pages to the eventual data structure. And each one of these phases at the time was a handwritten parallel computation where we would sort of decide how many machines we wanted to use. We would handwrite checkpointing code for each particular phase that would save the important state. Um, and that was kind of painful. And every time you wanted to add a phase, there was some new handwritten parallel uh, piece of code that you needed to, to write. Um, and really, a lot of the computations were actually quite simple. You know, you could express some of these phases. The actual core algorithms there were, you know, 100, 100 lines of code, but it became very clouded by all this sort of fault tolerance and checkpointing code that was wrapped around it, so that you could barely even find the, the actual nugget of, of cool stuff in there. Um, so we squinted at all these phases and came up with this abstraction that allowed us to express all the different uh, computations we wanted to express in the indexing system. Um, and the nice thing is this programming model is actually pretty simple. You write a couple of simple functions and then you can hide in the implementation a bunch of really nice features that everyone that then uses this programming abstraction can benefit from. In particular, the underlying system deals with scheduling operations so that they're on the same machines or nearby to the actual disks where the data resides. It handles machine failures automatically. It handles uh, sort of re-execution for fault tolerance. Um, it does a bunch of networking and disk transfer optimizations. And improvements to this core library then benefit everyone who's written code in this style. So that's a really nice property. So essentially, you write a map and a reduce function, and the rest of the fra framework takes care of all the other details. Um, and this actually turns out to be surprisingly general. You know, we probably have 50,000 different MapReduce parallel programs written at Google, and we run millions of them per day uh, to do all kinds of things, you know, render map tiles, process satellite imagery, do various indexing phases. Um, so again, this system was developed by a really small team. Myself and Sanjay Gimawat did the, uh, the work as part of the indexing uh, system. Uh, and one thing we did was we proved, we came up with this initial API, and then we wrote a very simple Im implementation of it so that we could prove that this API was useful and then wrote the indexing phases in terms of that API, even though the underlying implementation was not yet sort of very high performance. And then once we'd sort of convinced ourselves that this is a good idea, we eventually went through and rewrote a lot of the underlying implementation to make it much more efficient. Um, Again, really close ties with the initial users of the system. In fact, it was us. <laughs> uh, make things happen faster. You can really iterate and figure out what works well in part of a design and, and an interface and what doesn't if you're um, very closely involved. You're either the same people or you're sitting very close with users of your system. Um, and that was really helpful. Uh, so over time, we then wanted to have lots of different asynchronous systems updating different pieces of state about uh, um, kind of common uh, keys. So for example, in a crawling system, you have URLs, and then you have a bunch of different pieces of information that you want to keep about associated with the URL. You might want to keep the current crawled contents of the page. You might want to keep some uh, information about how, how important you believe that page to be that's computed through some large uh, computation. Um, the scale of all these different kinds of data is really large. And importantly, you want to be able to grow and shrink the resources that you devote to um, uh, storing some large data set uh, dynamically. So as your data set grows, you want to add machines to it and have those machines be used effectively. Um, so we came up with a system called Bigtable, which is, uh, has this kind of interesting um, data layout. In particular, it has rows and columns, and then it has a third dimension for time so that you can store multiple versions of things. And essentially, it's this three-dimensional 
view of data. Uh, the rows turn out to be ordered lexicographically. They're sorted, and that allows clients to get good locality properties um, by grouping similar rows they think will, they'll need uh, close together. And this turned out to be a good match for actually quite a number of our, our applications. You can look at lots of different problems we have, storing satellite imagery, storing crawled data, storing user preference data, and figure out how to map them into the system. Um, in order to arrange to spread data out, uh, we broke the row space up into things we call tablets, which are going to be little independent pieces managed by uh, different machines. And in particular, uh, there's a notion of splitting a tablet when it becomes too large. So essentially, you pick some midpoint in the tablet, and then you break it into two pieces, and now you have two independent pieces that can be managed separately. And that's how you get the scaling across lots of different machines is by tablet splitting and then moving tablets around so that uh, they're managed by different machines at different times. Uh, and essentially, we kept the same design of having a lot of the metadata centralized, but having all the data served by you know, this pool of 100 or 1,000 or a few thousand machines. And um, we built on top of the cluster file system we'd already built. Uh, and then clients just link stuff in directly into their program in order to access stuff, and they read and write directly from the, the servers. And they do metadata operations through the, through the master, but that's generally not a big bottleneck. So it's in production use for a really wide variety of, of uh, Google products. Uh, you know, we have uh, pretty big clusters, you know, thousands and thousands of, of tablet servers. Um, and I think there are a few lessons from Big Table. One is we decided we would not support distributed transactions. You know, the flexible row model allowed us to put some kinds of related data directly in the same row, and we did support transactions on the same row, but we decided not to have full distributed transaction support because it simplified our design a fair amount. Um, uh, the initial design was for a single Big Table cluster of, of a bunch of machines to be in a single data center. And uh, if you were running another one in another data center, those were completely independent. Um, eventually, we added some support for eventual consistency operations. So you could write into one of those big table clusters in one data center, and the writes would eventually show up on the other side in another data center, uh, eventually with no particularly strong guarantees. If everything's working well, it's you know, an order, order of a few hundred milliseconds. Uh, if not, it could be a uh, uh, longer delay. Um, so this system has served us pretty well and sort of underlies a lot of the Google products you use today. Um, eventually, some clients, uh, and a lot of clients, were able to make that system work really well for them. Some clients wanted a system that supports a little bit more consistency. They wanted the ability to have uh, cross-route transactions. Um, and they actually kind of wanted this mix of strong and weak consistency. Some kinds of data you want to be able to read and you want to be able to say, give me whatever data is conveniently available in my data center. And other ones, you want some guarantee where you say, I want the absolute latest value for this particular state. And so this mixture of both strong and weak consistency we think is pretty important because it allows developers to get the right trade-offs for different kinds of operations. Uh, we also wanted much more automated operation in the system. So we, for example, can automatically change replication of data across different data centers by fiddling with some policy things, and then the system automatically adapts to that. So this is kind of the picture of span, a spanner deployment across the world. You have a bunch of data centers you know, of varying size. Um, these blue rectangles are essentially zones in a spanner universe, and those zones are essentially semi-autonomous. So you can read the, the, most recent, the most recently available data from any zone uh, where your data resides. Uh, you can actually do quorums, uh, operations across collections of these to get consistent operations. And the users of the system specify high-level properties that they want. For example, uh, you can say, I want to store this data in five places, two somewhere in Europe, two in the US, and one in Asia. And that gives the system a lot of degrees of freedom to move things around among European data centers as one fills up and you know, one uh, a new data center comes online. Uh, without users having to very explicitly manage, you know, I need to copy data from the Munich data center to the Belgium data center or something like that. 
Uh, we went through a few different variations of the client API, you know, figuring out how to uh, unify both these strong and weak operations and uh, support these sort of constraints uh, took us a little while. Um, we started with many possible customers in mind. Many people had come to us and said, we want this kind of consistent operation. Uh, eventually, we worked with the Google Ads system because they were having scaling challenges and had a real need for the kinds of operations Spanner could support. Uh, that was both good and bad. I mean, the ad system at Google is kind of central to our business. And if you lose data or anything, that's, that's a really bad thing. So it was kind of a demanding first customer. We might have preferred a slightly less demanding first customer, but it all worked out OK. Um, one thing is that the, the Spanner has a different API than Bigtable. So we now have a fair amount of code of heavy Bigtable users that are a little bit harder to move over than we'd like. And we're sort of investigating what to do about that. OK, a few lessons from all this. Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, if you talk to clients when you're considering building software infrastructure, you know, you'll get lots of different demands for things. And you'll hear the same thing over and over from, some, from a bunch of different clients. You'll hear kind of one-off demands from some uh, fairly esoteric and exotic client that wants some feature that seems kind of very at odds with what everyone else seems to want. Uh, but you kind of aggregate all these different demands together. And what you find is that perhaps people really want eight different things. Doing six of them in a system is actually not so hard. Doing seven is pretty tricky. If you try to do all eight, you're really going to probably make a worse system for everyone than uh, if you kind of backed off on one of those demands. Because really, you'll make something that's either too slow or too complicated or something like that. So it's important to kind of balance the complexity of the system with all the different demands you're getting. Uh, don't build infrastructure just for its own sake. It's really helpful to have motivating, driving applications for, the, for why you're building this system and have an initial set of customers, one, in particular working closely with one customer while keeping other ones in mind is really, really useful. By customer here, I mean other groups within the same organization in our case. Um, ideally, you'll use your own infrastructure to build something useful on top of it, because that allows you to iterate really fast and get feedback about what's working well. But if you're not able to do that, you're going to work with another team instead of using it yourself. It's really helpful if you're actually physically co-located and working together every day, not kind of syncing up via infrequent weekly or semi-weekly meetings. Um, if you're sitting within 50 feet of each other, it's really easy to walk over and say, hey, how do I do this? Or this doesn't seem to work really well. And that's all I have. There's a bunch of papers you can read for further details. Thank you.